to edition 102 of All Killer No Filler podcast with me, Rachel Fairburn, and Kira Pritchard McLean. Just before we start, we'll do our usual disclaimer. <laughs> this isn't hero worship. We do this podcast because we have mutual interest in serial killers. And as long as we are doing this podcast, it stops us from writing to them in prison. True. Do you realise when you pointed at me, you moved your hands like a muppet, like they were both <laughs> on two sticks? It turns out I am actually a, a puppet. <laughs> draw these. Well, you've got some thin little legs, like two bits of wool hanging down. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever seen Kermit's legs? It's weird. Yeah, they're very. Like he's got. He's got quite. Um, they're, they're very floppy, aren't they? Yeah. My granddad loved Kermit the Frog, and um, Bert and Ernie, and just record them off the TV. So he just used to have like a video of Kermit the Frog, <laughs> like because he just found him really funny. Not Miss Piggy. No, have I, have I told you the story about Miss Piggy and my friend? So <laughs> No, but I can't wait to hear it. So my friend Phil Padgett, you've met Phil Padgett. Yeah, yeah. He went, to, what did, he went to something when he was a kid and it was, um, the Muppets were there and Miss Piggy was there and it was to meet Miss Piggy and she, uh, he went to meet her and as, as he walked up, he was probably about seven, she hitched her skirt up and went, oh, to him, right? <laughs> and he just said it was so, he was so embarrassed. Oh, I thought it was going to be a sexual awakening. Uh, no, he said he was so embarrassed and it was so inappropriate. <laughs> and every time he sees Miss Piggy now, he's like, there she is. And the says, absolute derogatory. <laughs> I can't <laughs> wait for Miss Piggy to get me tooed. About she's time. terrible. I think, you know, she's she's uh, very chaotic. I'm not a big fan of Miss Piggy. I find her quite annoying at times. I like her. I think yeah. that she's, yeah, I love her chaos. I like that mm. she's brash. Also, if you look at some of her looks through the years, absolutely incredible. Oh, yeah, I mean, she's got some good clobber, without yeah. a doubt. What were we talking about? Serial killers. Serial killers. <laughs> there we go. That was it. I would not be surprised if it turned out Kermit was on the, on the old killing spree. Most likely I was, Muppet I was waiting for kill. you to finish that, and I thought she was going to say drugs, register. <laughs> no. Like, what's coming next? It's always the nice ones, isn't it? He's the Muppet most likely to murder. Do you think? Yes. Absolutely. Animal? No. No, 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 no. Fozzy she... Bear. He... Fozzy Bear? No, Fozzy Bear is a... He would kill a sex worker by accident. Oh, like Lenny of Mice and Men. A hundred... Too hard. Yeah, there would be something like that, and, and it'd, it'd be like, oh, God, you know, like, oh, I didn't mean it. And he genuinely didn't. But unfortunately... That is not a defence. What a way to start <laughs> to desecrate the memory of some of those beloved children's entertainers. Is that what you call them? Uh, children's uh, icons of childhood. I icons w- of childhood, the Muppets. Dis- if you've got Disney Plus, I think they put all the Muppet shows on there. I had a, I was watching, you know when you have something on in the background, usually it's The Simpsons is the go-to one. And i tell you what the Muppets and The Simpsons have in common. Hate Chinese people. <laughs> and there's so much racist stuff. Really? In the Muppet, yeah, because it's the 70s. So, like... Oh. You know, it's there's some there's some quite spicy stuff in there. The Simpsons. Oh, the Simpsons hate trans people, Chinese people, like that. The, all the jokes are about like trans women or Chinese people for the first twelve series. I would say there's a lot of it, like to the point where it's incredibly jarring now. Oh no, I've got look who I've got on my notebook. There we go. And that's because you hate Chinese people. It's Bart Simpson, but he's clothed <laughs> on this. That is a callback to an earlier episode. Yeah, if Don't you're watching this in. for the first time, that's a really weird thing to stress. Do you know, have you noticed here in my notebook, I've got pics of, and, and this was to remind me about a joke, it actually said pics of kids. And it was just in my notebook on the train, so I had to scribble it out. It was to remind me about a joke that I was going to do that was about pictures of kids, or ki- people taking pictures of the kids, but he just said pic- pictures of kids in the notebook, and I, I thought, oh. I think the only thing, like, Like more... a very organised people. <laughs> 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 the only thing more incriminating than pictures of kids written down in a notebook is the word kids scribbled out in yeah, case well, other people that see is, it. Yeah, that is a problem. We're going to yeah. be chatting today about um, John Reginald Reg- Halliday Christie. Yes. That's all the names. I think it's a cracking set of names there. It is known to his family as Reg Christie. Mm -hmm. Uh, He committed murders over a 10-year period uh, from 1943 to 1953. The six murders that we know of, I think there's probably more. Yes, absolutely. There's definitely more. Uh, He usually strangled his victims after he'd made them unconscious with domestic gas. He also raped some of the victims while they were unconscious. Mm -hmm. He was born on the 8th of April, 1899, which is weird because... you. it feels not that long ago, this, but then he was born in the Victorian era. Yeah. It feels weird, doesn't it? But the Victorian era just banged on for ages anyway. he His childhood is quite an interesting one in that it's a bit unremarkable. Mm. 
in that he kind of like he doesn't have loads of friends at school he but he gets on all right and he yeah. does quite well at school he just sort of keeps his head down joins the choir um and gets very into scouts that's a big thing for him he's a king scout What's that? Massive dweeb, I imagine. <laughs> That's right. Sorry imagine. if you're watching or listening. Do you, come on. Do you think anyone? Yes. It, an adult, yes. Do you think an adult scout is watching this? A, a, what they're called, a fucking brown owl. That's it, brownies, isn't it? I don't know. Ah, Kayla. I don't, is, that, is that right? Owen is... is oh, oh, you no. a scouter? Oh, fucking hell. Here we go. Here we Interesting. go. Interesting. I'm making the team feel unsafe. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like being back at Scouts. <laughs> I uh, I never did any of that. I think we've no. talked, spoken about this before, so I don't really know the lingo. I think I've mentioned this that I because I was I was spoken about this before. I was very very shy when I was a child and, and in early adulthood, and to in an attempt to get me to be a bit more outgoing, my mum threatened I would say me with going to brownies one day after school. And I just remember all day I had this... It was like I was being led to my death. Really? Oh, God. I can still remember. I was probably about, probably about seven, eight and nine, maybe. And you can remember nine. the feeling? I can remember the feeling. I can remember sitting there in school going, oh, God, this is awful. This is awful. Oh, God. I, I, all the things I'd rather do than this. And it was the anxiety building up all day. And I was so nervous. And I, I was nearly crying all day. And then my, my grand picked me up, took me, took me home. And I was like, oh, God, I don't want to go to this. And, and, and my mum forgot. Oh, so, that's so funny. <laughs> so I didn't go, but that's so I just funny. remember being so stressed out about it. It's like my worst nightmare. Just no, I can't, can't do it. Can't How do did it. you cope with school then? Um, I suppose that's a bit different because you, you're with the same people every day, aren't you? Right. So, that I, so is it new people? It's like anxiety. It was new people. It was family and friends. Absolutely fine. But any situation outside of that, I, I was like mute. Really? I just I couldn't like I couldn't speak. Completely tongue tied. Well, that. That relates to John Christie as well, because uh, he had a period of, of being mute, didn't he? He did. But we must say, he was born in, in Yorkshire, West Yorkshire, in North Rowham, which is about two and a half miles from Halifax and six and a half miles from Bradford. They have, in that little village, an annual scarecrow festival. Do they? Yeah. How do you know that? I just had a little Google, mate. You know? I feel like every village has an annual scarecrow. Yeah. And there's always, like, one that's, you know, there'll be a scarecrow in the news because it looks like it's... Like dressed like King Charles and you know, oh, they'll have a Boris Johnson one. They'll have a Boris Johnson one, yeah. The, there was recently one in Wales, and they had a. I'll we'll try and find it. There was a King, the King Charles. I find it really weird saying that. Yeah, I yeah. always want to say Spaniel, King Charles <laughs> and Camilla, and I think you know which way the person who made this fell on the old Diana Camilla thing because it is one of the most unfla. <laughs> oh. It's basically a set of teeth. Oh, no. With some eyes on top. It's absolutely... Like those things. Yeah, that... it's awful. It's so... If I was Camilla, I'd be like, oh, fuck, really? Uh, have I told you that I've got a cactus? You might have seen it. A cactus that looks like Boris Johnson. Yes. Have you seen him? Yes. Well, some weed has grown at, at the back. So that is now Carrie. <laughs> <laughs> Someone's going to be watching this in like two years' time. We're like, what are they on what about? Are they... Who are these people? <laughs> that was eight prime ministers ago. <laughs> So he was quite an unusual. Look. Well, he had red hair, so he was a, he was a redhead with. Did um, he? Yeah, yeah, it was. Strange. I didn't know that. Didn't um, know. With pale blue eyes, and he was bullied a lot for the size of his forehead, which I don't think is a curse either of us have. I think we've got some of the smallest foreheads in I, show business. I disagree. I think I've got a big fod. Are you kidding? No, 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 no. So it's I, tiny. No, I might have told you this, before. Rachel. It's like two fifty p. That's not a big a forehead. Pound's worth. Yeah. It's big forehead. It's like when it's a tenner laid out. I, I might have told you this. So, you know, never look on the comments. Oh, why do never. you do it? Well, it was lockdown and I was I was fragile as it was. And I thought, maybe someone's written something nice about me. <laughs> and they hadn't. And Learned I, that lesson. I honestly don't. To this day, I don't know why I did this. I looked at a video of me online. which And I didn't watch the video. I just went straight to the comments. And one of the comments was, her features are too small for her face. And I was like, oh, that's quite rude. I didn't need to sort of worry about that now instead of COVID. So, but then I said to my friend James, I said, uh, anyway, so I looked at this video and then someone had written this underneath and he went, yeah. I went, oh, yeah, is that what you think as well, oh, is it? Is that what everyone's saying about me? I don't think he was listening to me, to be quite honest. This is like, I used to have a bit about this and it's absolutely true. On a night out, someone would come up and said, oh, you look like Nessa from Gavin and Stacey. They were like, oh, you're Welsh. And I was like, and then I was at 90, like, oh, no, I was maybe like 20. I was pretty like... 
sad about that because I had this big paranoia of being like the fat girl in my group of friends, even though I wasn't fat then at all. But so it was like this whole thing. And I was telling someone about, trying to reclaim it by telling it as a funny story when I worked at the Trafford Centre. And I said to the guy, I saw someone last night came up and said, I look like one from Gavin and Stacey. And Smithy. I said, no, not Smithy. <laughs> not Smithy. <laughs> the, no. Yeah, absolutely true. No. Yeah, yeah, absolutely true. I still stand up on that. It's too sad now. I am shocked, appalled, <laughs> stunned, amused. For the record, I think that both Ruth Jones and James Corden are very good-looking people, but it's also at, like, 20 is not necessarily who you want to be compared to. Especially because the character of Nessa is designed to be unattractive. Like, she's mm. meant to be sort of, like... It's, she's, it's meant to be sort of stark, the way she acts It's meant to be dresses. intimidating, isn't she? Yeah, exactly, yeah. And it's not when you're in, like, a, you know, trying to be a little indie princess that someone's like, you look like a biker from South Wales. The thing is, though, like, people are just rude. That's the thing. People, people just, are rude. You know, it's very... It's, people are just basic, aren't they? You know? Do you know what's going to happen is people are going to scroll down and start to comment and... Hey, comments are off, off on this. I'm we've not interested, mate. Go- comments are off. If you're listening to this on the podcast, welcome, obviously. If you're watching this on YouTube, we're now putting them on YouTube. We have made the executive decision to switch comments off because Mm -hmm. I don't don't think that a plus size woman and a woman with body dysmorphia (laughs) need that. If if you've got (laughs) anything to say, say it to my face. My gigs are all listed. Buy a ticket, come and tell me to my face. You're going to regret saying that as a man (laughs) continuously follows you around the country. Well, it's so funny because Tim actually said to me the other week, he was like, oh, do you know, I do worry sometimes. What if if somebody, you know, it would be very easy to, to, you know, you shouldn't tell people where you are sometimes. You know, if you mention at gigs, you say you're in uh, Gosport or wherever. And I went, all my gigs are on the internet. Yeah. If somebody wants to find me, you can find me. You will know where I am Which at is, whatever time. It's why stalking in comedy is quite common. Mm. It happens to a lot, especially, it skews a lot more towards women, but there's men as well. It's happened, actually, quite a lot that, uh, like I say, male comedians have been stalked. I know of about yeah. four. Yeah. That have, uh, I know someone that, uh, this was back in the day, that someone sent Polaroid pictures to their house. What? And he was like, I don't know how they found my house. Someone, was well, some, I, uh, Someone was telling me that someone messaged him on Instagram and went, right, I've worked out exactly which house you live in. It's this, isn't it? And sent a picture of the door and was like, because you mentioned that you shop here and da-da-da and that you got this bus. And like after listening to their podcast, I've worked out where they live. Good luck finding out where I live, guys, because people who know where I live can't find it. So. Well, the thing is, I always think as well, if you found out where I live, what are you going to do? You're going to knock on and I'm going to tell you to fuck off. <laughs> what What is going to happen? You, you You're not going to get in. I'm never in. And then you get in, and, and then what? <laughs> what? What are you going to do? It's like when we did that live show, and I'm like, yeah, I'm staying in this hotel. What are you going to do? You're going to get in my room? No. <laughs> what, what are you going to do with that information? You need to stop handing out your room numbers at live shows, though. That is reckless yeah, what, behavior what that do? I feel like is a red flag that I'm ignoring. What are they going to do? They can't get in the hotel because they don't have a key card. You can't get in. I'm sure they could be like, I'm so sorry. My friend Rachel Fairburn is staying in this room. I My phone's dead. Can I just phone up to her? There's there's no phone in the rooms. In what you about? What hotels are you staying in? There's no phone in your room. There's, there's, p- hotels don't Pay have phones. Pay five or more. Are you mad? They all have phones in. No, Premier Inns do not have phones in. What? They don't. Most hotels do not have phones in now at all. I said in one recently that did in Newcastle, and that was an old fashioned hotel. Nah, they've all got phones in, mate. Do not write in. I don't care enough about this <laughs> to have the debate. Anyway, so he got made fun of for having a large, uh, well, it was referred to as an enormous forehead. Brutal. It's brutal, isn't it? I mean, all the pictures I've seen of him is when he's lost his hair. So, yeah, he's got a big forehead, but it's just because it starts further back. Yeah, yeah. Because of the, that's where but his fringe it's mad, starts. Because I don't associate him with hair. That's the that's the other thing. I see him as bald. I yeah. see him as a bald guy. And black and white as well. You can't tell if someone no. what hair colour someone is. So he, yes, he was had this sort of childhood that was um, quite unremarkable. Now, mm-hmm. he was the only boy in a... Basically, had just loads of sisters. Sixth of seven, child, seven children. Yeah. And his dad, Ernest, lovely name, was a carpet designer. Nice job. Yeah. He apparently was a very serious man. Mm. Didn't really show emotion. Um, I mean, what do people want from a dad? Also, Victorian times, like... Yes. That, that feels fairly normal to me. He, uh, his dad sort of used to berate him quite a bit. And I think, didn't, um, didn't he dress up in his sister's clothes a couple of times playing? Yes. And his dad was sort of like, 
we're not having that in this house. Yes. I mean, very old. You would get that now, not that that's right. But, you know, back in that time, it was sort of, they were worried about him being a wimp or, you know, a, a sissy, obviously with code for gay. And that he was worried about his son being effeminate. And he, he was sort of had the closest relationship with his mother as well. And then something kind of weird starts to develop with him and his sisters. Maybe, like, maybe when he was dressing up in the clothes, his dad was like, look, you can take that dress off right now, but keep the hat on, it covers the forehead. <laughs> <laughs> his sisters were quite... Uh, they were sort of weird. They kind of liked him, but also were quite mean to him at the same time, which I don't think is a... Well, it's siblings. It's what you're quite, describing as siblings. Yeah, yeah. It's normal behaviour. And also I feel like there's a lot of pressure and a lot of emphasis put on the women mm. in his life being responsible for his actions, which are his actions Absolutely. alone. So there's a lot of criticism of the mum for being overbearing and making him a mummy's boy and the sisters for being sort of like mean-spirited. But like, the, you've got sisters, they're just going to be mean. Well, you, you can't win, can you? As, as a, when you're the mother of a, a murderer... You're either too protective, oh yeah, absolutely, or you don't do anything. Yeah. So whatever you do, is, is the reason why the person's done what they've done. Yeah. And it, it's it's a bit more complicated than that, isn't it? He saw his uh, sister's knee when he was ten, though, didn't he? And this was <laughs> this is such a ma- every every like source talks about this is that like. <laughs> Well, two big moments. This is the two big moments in his life. One, when he saw his dead granddad, because he was scared of his granddad, he wasn't yeah. scared anymore. We'll talk about that in a second. Mm-hmm. Number two, when he accidentally saw one of his sister's knees. I'm like, these two things aren't the same, no. a dead body and a knee. And I appreciate, again, Victorian times, but basically one of his sisters had accident- done a Miss Piggy, if you will, hitched up the skirt <laughs> at a seven-year-old. Yeah. And he had seen a bit of knee and he became very, he was sort of fixated on this and very aroused. So... That created a lot of confusion in him, a lot of anger, and they, they. This is where they attribute his sort of um, his association with sexual desire towards women as being something that is shameful and anger inducing as well. I don't know. There's a lot of credit given there to his recollection of events. Yeah, well, and the, blaming this is the other thing, isn't it? Like this is all, uh, you know, a lot of this is from his side. Yeah. Um, now he. As we've said, said before, it, one a big thing that happened to him was when he saw uh, his grandfather dead. Now, he was frightened of his grandfather, David Halliday. He died in March 1911, age 75. and Good old age for them. Not a bad age at all. And Christy saw him laid out on a trestle table. No dignity there. No. It's not a, it's not a cake sale. <laughs> So he's oh, laid out. just next to a tea urn, and because he was so frightened, I'd love an urn of tea. I absolutely, lo- I love tea out of an urn. Are you serious? Yeah. Have you seen the one at my house? No, my, it was my nine's urn. Oh, it's amazing. It's like a big urn. copper one from my nine. And my brother, he's always like, I want, I want the tea urn. I want the tea urn when mum and dad died. My brother's at, genuinely one of my brothers goes around and put post-it notes on things in my parents' house that he wants when they die. No. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> He was like, well, it saves confusion. And I was like, yeah, and alienates a family. Yeah. So he's, <laughs> so, so the other brutal. one's like, I just, I don't want, I just want the tea urn because I remember making tea with nine in that. It's never been used. It's never been used. He's like, I want the tea urn. I was like, it's in my house. You're asking to remove something from my house. <laughs> I think we, we get, let's get the urn back in action. Crack out the let, urn. Let, crack out the Make urn. Make some new memories with it. Make some new urn memories. Um, so he sees his grandfather and because... He was so frightened of him, and then he was like, well, he, he can't frighten me now because he's dead, he can't do anything. I would he, say it's more frightening to see someone dead than that. Well, life. absolutely. I mean, I've never seen a dead body. I've no interest in seeing one. I, I, I just don't want... I'm not interested. It's frightening. Yeah. Very final. Yeah. Dim no Making thanks. me feel a bit ill thinking about it. But he, uh, it's very much like um, Nilsson as well, this. Well, I think he's a lot like BTK. It's like the opposite oh, yeah, of yeah. Nilsson. So when Dennis Nilsson saw his grandfather dead, he was very upset and mm-hmm. he couldn't, you know, he was a very small boy, he was very close to his grandfather. And then seeing him, him dead sort of, well, it terrified him and upset him. And he mm. had, he, he just, then he became obsessed with the fact that some, you know, the dead body, because it had such yeah. an impact on him. He's gone the opposite way. And he's like, woo, spring break. <laughs> he's dead. Yeah, he finds and I'm, death freeing, right? Yeah, that's it. And it's sort of, taken a weight off his shoulders mm. it's like he can't hurt me anymore he can't uh, I mean it, we do say I mean I, I, I don't know about his account a lot of the time well you know 
the, I'm a bit sort of suspicious about some of the stuff that he says. Well, this is what's really difficult, isn't it? That if you're working from, even when we've got like quite contemporary, accurate sources, lots of coverage in newspapers of the trial and things you can be quite sure of. But when it comes to, when these people are arrested and they get to sort of tell their story, you are listening to what a psychopath yeah. thinks has made them the way they are. Yes. And everyone like... It's like inside the actor's studio for serial killers when they do that confession thing. So they're thinking about, like, what is my mythology? How do I do what I do? And it's really cringe a lot of the time. And also, we just take at face value that they're not just talking themselves up or making excuses for themselves. Yes, absolutely. Which is why so many women are blamed, is my opinion. He had a very high IQ. Yeah. Uh, An IQ of 128, which is high. Apparently the top 5% of the UK. He uh, spent a lot of time in visiting graveyards, which people thought was weird. I don't think it is. That's what I do in my spare time. Yeah, it is, isn't it? That's what I do. He was, around graveyards. he was scared of dirt. Yeah, but I don't think you do what he did. Oh, so he was God. scared of dirt, and he was quite. He was described as being fragile. But he used to go <laughs> when he got this obsession with death. He used to go to graveyards, and he used to go and there was one tomb that had like cracks in it, and he would peek through to see if he could see the body inside. I, see, I don't do that because I don't want to see that. But I do think that that is a normal thing for a kid to do. Yes, I went through, definitely went through a graveyard phase yeah. of being sort of, and even now, I, can't, I just can't, I have to opt out of them because I spend too much, not spend too much time in them, I just get the sads. Do you? Yeah, I get, I'm like, all these people have forgotten, no one who, everyone who loves them is dead. The, like, oh yeah, yeah, I, time I think that's too short. Bit. And, yeah, and then I have to go around reading every name because then I think, well, that's like, they're still here. Yeah. Yeah, but some of those people will have been cons. Absolutely. So don't, you know. Yeah. Not every grave. Do you know how I tell, actually? Because there's a little graveyard near me. And how if I tell their cunts or not? They've got an English name. That's how I tell. <laughs> oh, don't write in. No comments. I didn't say that. There you go. <laughs> so, um, where we also, Oh, yeah. He he was a hypochondriac. Yes. That I started in childhood and escalated listen, into life. I can't be a fucking arse with this. You are, well, you're with one. And I know this sounds really bad. Tim, you you do lay it on a bit thick. He vocalises every illness. I just don't think you have to vocalise every... Oh, I've got a bit of an... Oh, I feel, just shut up. Get on with it. Have you talked I, about the tiny bell? And that sounds like I'm going to say something <laughs> like I'm going to body shame in is here. It, is it <laughs> naked Bart Simpson again? <laughs> right, so basically what happens is Tim consistently tells me that he doesn't feel well. And, he vo- and sometimes he isn't well, fine. But the problem is when you vocalise every minor... Last time I was at yours, he thought you had dengue fever. Oh, yeah, please don't. So he, what I do now is when he... So I've invented this little character that lives in <laughs> Elizabeth Tower, which is where Big Ben is, fact fans. The bell is called Big Ben, not the tower. So I have invented this little character who rings a, a bell in there when he's been had a day when he's not been ill. So... I'm constantly sending this little character home. So what happens is Tim will say, oh, I've got a headache. And I get my phone and I go, I, uh, yeah, can you just tell him to leave now and he may as well just take the rest of the weekend off? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's if he wants to go away for a few days, just let him know. Bell won't be being rung today, right? Imagine <laughs> if we covered on here a serial killer, right? Who every time, it was a man, and every time their, their wife was sick, had reoccurring sickness, you know, had a, a weakened immune system, went, oh, I'm just going to ring the person who rings the tiny bell saying you're okay and say they can go home. We'd be like, what a twat. We hate him, what a misogynist. Look, but when you do it, it's all right, like, I, isn't it? I am, um, listen, this, we are talking about a fit and healthy young man. This is what we're talking about. We're talking about a well He's man. not fit and healthy, is he? He's fine. There is nothing wrong with him. <laughs> he's fit, he's healthy, he's strong. There is nothing the matter with him. Nothing the matter. Occasionally, yes. We, we all have, you know, we might Dengue be Dengue fever every now and then. He, I remember he, he had, um, not co- he had something that was like, a, he had really bad flu and he did, to be fair. He really did. He was very poorly. But it was just like E.T. when he's all white in that river. He was just like <laughs> lying in bed going, <laughs> to me, I'm like, oh, fucking just pull yourself together, will you? You know. <laughs> oh, you're the reason men kill women like you. <laughs> well, do you know what? I'd rather be right and dead <laughs> than I don't know what the alternative is. Anyway. But the hypochondria continues into his adulthood because he's um he fights in the war, which he talks about an awful mm-hmm. lot. And he's part of a mustard gas attack. Mm-hmm. 
and he uh, it, as a result he goes temporarily blind and he it affects his voice and he is completely mute cannot speak at all for about six months he's totally silent and in fact he doesn't really speak very much for the rest of his life he was sort of a man of few words but how he gets found out i love this how he gets found out is uh he's he's everyone assumes that he's mute he's unable to speak and uh then what happens is someone is shouting at him and basically having a one-way argument with him and he answers them back and then is like... <laughs> so he could speak, he'd just chosen he not chose to. He chose not to. Yeah. He, um, there is also no record of, the bli- of blindness. It was temporary blindness and he continued to say that he was blind and, but, and there, was, there is no record. Do you think all. he did that in the way of being like, oh, I'm blind, thinking he could like get into, you know, just like... I'm, just, I'm fine to be in the women's changing rooms because I'm blind. Like, <laughs> do you think he was using it for his advantage? Um, because now it would yeah, be... Yeah, of course he was. I think it, it, it was a hypochondriac, he probably likes the attention, but also it's like, oh, well, if I'm blind, I, uh, I'm going to get discharged from the army. Oh, uh, okay, yeah. I think that... So you're saying he's a coward. I'm saying he's a coward as Interesting. well. Interesting. Uh, he had apparently an interest in seeing the corpses of people killed in action. Oh, gosh, yeah. What was it called? There's... um. That, that But that was sort of, uh, a, like, not a fetish at the time. A pastime. It was a pastime, yeah, where people would sort of seek out seeing dead bodies or, or pictures of dead bodies. Yeah. Do you know what? This is very weird. So my... I don't know much about my maternal grandfather. So he's the Scottish one, the Glaswegian. I knew he was in the army. Um, and something to do with... I think it's when they were establishing... Israel within Palestine. Very much one of the good guys there. So he, he was, I know, I just know he was over in Palestine. And then there's this photo album that my mum got. It was like, oh, this is, you do, my dad used to take pictures. And I'm flicking through it and it's like, it's a real sort of snapshot in time. But loads of it is dead bodies. He's just taking Ooh. pictures of like, there would be like an attack or, you know, a battle or something. And they just, it's, I was like, we can't have this. This is strange. This oh, I don't know. I think it's war photography. I think that's all right. Well, I was. I went very Indiana Jones, and I was like, this belongs in a museum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And not I would say so. On a coffee table. Yeah, I think that's. I think that should definitely be in a, an archive somewhere. If you would like doubt. pictures of dead people it, in the Middle East, I'm your girl. And, and was he? Was your granddad dead before you were born? Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. He died when my brothers were small. Yeah. Oh. Never met him. That's sad, isn't it? It is very sad. That's what happens if you leave a big... Leave it late to have children and leave a big gap between them. In the past. (laughs) No, it's fine. Speaking of graves, actually, my (laughs) uh, dad and mum took my niece and my nephews to Wales, South Wales, where my dad's from, and they had a bit of a mooch around sort of where he's from and all that kind of stuff a few weeks ago. And I I was actually thinking, because I've I've never been... I've never... I went to my grandfather's funeral in Wales, didn't some grandma's because I was too little, but... I uh, they sent me a picture of of the the graveyard and, and the the grave and I, I, at first I didn't I didn't know what it was because I didn't know that that's what they were doing and I just this grave popped up and it just said Fairburn at the top and I went what the <laughs> hell is this and I was like I looked at it I was like oh my god it's like right there it is fine right but I, it just really shocked me because I didn't expect to where see it where are they it. from Slander B in South Wales oh so they're in the the churchyard there uh, buried with their daughter Philippa who died as a child. Is that where you get That's your Philippa from? That's where my middle from? name comes from. That I uh, spell incorrectly pretty much every time I write it. What? Oh, uh, two, two I many? don't know if it's two L's, two P's. I, ain't got <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't write that often. Just say, also, when you say, just go, oh, I spell it the Welsh way. There we go. So he uh, he meets a woman called Ethel. Oh, now, hang on, no dick. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. He also... Says he was scarred by early sexual encounters. Isn't everyone? You're not different. Yeah, they're not vintage, are they, yeah. when you look back? Apparently... Oh God, what a capable person <laughs> doing that to me. <laughs> Him and his a group of male friends went out one evening to meet these girls, and he, he was he's about 15 at this point. And they all sort of paired off with these girls and were snogging and doing whatever it is that they did in those days. I think the same thing that we do now. I don't think I don't think the techniques have changed. I just I imagine maybe all... you don't sing the national anthem when you're doing it. I think that's the only difference. <laughs> I just imagine a lot of tweed. That's what I imagine. Twi- on children. Uh, well, yeah, you young girls because you dressed sort of older then, didn't they? Yeah, but not that old. I don't know. I don't know. Just old fashioned, isn't it? Anyway, age fifteen, he gets off with this girl and he couldn't get an erection, and 
she told everybody, apparently, and people gave him nicknames like Reggie No Dick and Can't Do It Krista. They're mean. It is mean, yeah. That's but... mean. And that is the kind of thing that would stay with you forever. Yeah, yeah, but you, you, you can move on from that. Also, I mean, that's interesting, isn't it? Because I think that must have been a good-looking girl and or thin, because if I, as a as a fat woman, right? If a, if yeah, because like as a fat woman, if I, it's happened the other day. Someone sat on a chair and it broke, and I was thinking they're lucky they're thin. Because if it was because it's just a breaking chair when you're a thin person, but if you're a fat person, everyone's like that person just broke a chair. And it's yeah, the same yeah, yeah, with yeah. like if I was get like a teenager and was fat and was getting off with someone and they couldn't get up, it would be right because of me. It wouldn't be it because wouldn't, of them. So okay. I can tell from that. Look at that. Is that his- historical analysis? I can tell that that was a thin and or attractive woman. Oh, I enjoyed that. That was a very nice... Uh... Foray into my insecurities. <laughs> it, the, the, listen, now, the thing is as well, they did say that after Christie's death, they did the post-mortem and they revealed that his genitals were normal. <laughs> oh, don't put that on the list. <laughs> you don't need to know. Yeah, just because in just because in year eight he was called No Dick, we did have a little check there, and it is normal. You don't need to root around everything. <laughs> root around. Just leave it be. <laughs> and a corpse is bits. Yeah, and also just like around. defending the honour of his erection. Like, there's no need for that. <laughs> so. Are we going to talk about Ethel? Ethel, yeah. So we must say it was, it was demobbed. That's what they say, isn't it? Because I can't say demobilised. Demobilised on the 22nd of October 1919. That's my sister's birthday, not the year. <laughs> uh, he joined the Air Force in 1923, but he was discharged on the 15th of August 1924. Uh, probably for being ill. Probably people are sick of listening to him being ill. So he meets Ethel, and he marries her in 1920. Ethel was described oh, as hell. kind, plain, smart and thoughtful. Strap in. I've got different descriptions for her. Oh, God, go on. Submissive, big boned. Why those two? Why those two? <laughs> Submissive and big boned. Are you absolutely kidding me? What, that, what's she like? <laughs> Submissive and big boned. It reminds me of, do you know one, um, Count Duckula? Nanny. Oh, nanny, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Ducky boos. Submissive and big boned. What an absolute one, two, co- a left, right combination of things you don't want to be described as terrible as a, as a young woman kind plain smart thoughtful big boned submissive submissive really mean fucking hell now so they married but he didn't treat her very well no. he he would frequently he would he frequent sex workers mm-hmm. and he'd cheat on her all the time and they did separate actually after 10 years because he accused her of being unfaithful which yes. by that point she may have been, but it was certainly him that started it. They did say that the, there was gossip that, that he was quite violent towards her. Yeah. And that she only stayed with him through fear. But they also said that she did tease him about his impotence. And uh, they 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 lived together. They worked at, um, Ethel worked at Garside Engineering and uh, the English Electrical Company in Bradford. So they're mm. still in Yorkshire at this point. Um, Eth- Ethel had a, a miscarriage early in the marriage um, and they didn't have any children. They separated after four years, and Christy moved to London, and Ethel moved to Sheffield. Oh, yes, yeah, I thought they were together longer than that. Yeah, so she moved to Sheffield, and she's getting on well there, and she's having quite a ni- l- nice life, but he wants her back and makes sort of a bid for it. It's a, it's a, it's a clearly, like, not a good relationship. There's a lot of this going on at the time, though, where people get married and actually would just separate but still stay married. Well, they spend a lot of time apart. So they're apart for a decade. Yeah. And he's in and out of prison in London, for which which we'll get to in a bit. Uh, in the interim of this, you do know that he was a keen photographer, don't you? Oh, really? And he had a studio where he'd take women to. Okay. Right, like Rodney Alcala. Oh, really? Yeah. He te- he's a little bit of lots of people, yeah, this guy. Yeah, he is. Yeah, he is. Uh, <sighs> God, so let me change Ta- Taylor's oldest time that is convincing women that they can be models so you can take pictures yeah. of them for your own personal gains. He had uh, several convictions, se- several mm. convictions for several offences. Uh, while working as a postman in 1921, he stole postal orders and received three months in a- a- HMP Manchester. Is it's- he in strange ways? Yeah. You can, you can see that from where we are now. Have you... Uh, I once was doing what was it what was i doing something at work and there was americans in the uh, tour thing and i was talking about something and i said uh sh- in strange ways prison and they said and then after it they said uh, 
that, that was it was hanged in strange ways. Mm. Uh, can, can I ask a question? What strange ways were they hanged? I'm like, oh, oh God, no, the prison's so called funny. Strange Ways. <laughs> they were hanged in strange ways, just by the ears. <laughs> that's so funny. Um, yeah, I guess it's weird. well, is Strange Ways the area. Yeah, Strange Ways is that's where my my mum's from. Strange Ways. Oh, so it's a district. It's the district. Yeah, yeah. But you, I don't hear of anything called that anyway. It's Cheatham Hill. Cheatham Hill, Strange Ways. Yeah. Is it? Yeah, yeah. So my, my, my family, my mum's family are from Strangeways and Cheetah Mill. Yeah. Wow. So that's the area of Strangeways prison. I think um, I, uh, my mum, the school my mum used to go to, the school playground, you could see Strangeways from the... Um, Strangeways is a prison, by the way. That's what, that's what we're talking about. Strangeways, here we come, a Smith's album. Did they, did they wave at the prisoners on the roof? I think they... Well, do you know I saw the riots? So I was at... I think I was at junior school... So Strange Ways riots in the 90s, all the prisoners got out onto the roof kicking off about conditions in the prison. Which were appalling. It still is, to be honest. It's a, it's, it's, it needs nice that you keep checking in. Well, it's, well, it's a very uh, old building mm. and it's pretty grim. Uh, so all the prisoners got on the roof and they were protesting about the conditions in there. And we were going to... It was like a school trip to somewhere. But before we went wherever we were going, the coach driver stopped us off at, at strange ways so we could see the prisoners on the roof. What? Yeah, and we all, like, waved at them. <laughs> yeah, so we saw, Solidarity. We saw Yeah, we saw them on the roof. You can tell that's a safe labour seat when they pull yeah, you yeah. over on a school <laughs> trip to wave at the prisoners. It was a huge... It was like a national news yeah. story, though. It was like a massive, massive story. There's been plays about it since and stuff. Plays about it, Have yeah. I talked about staying in Bodmin Prison on the podcast? No, not yet. Have I not? No, no. Is it, I've been to Bodmin Prison, I've never stayed in it. How was it? Well, so there's a hotel in a part of it now. Some of it is like a historical, you know, like, ooh, kind yeah, of yeah. thing. And some of it is like a visitor experience. Did you pay the barman to go under the, into oh. the thing? Because when I went to Bodmin Jail, when I went years ago, that you went into the pub and you, you paid the barman. I don't know why I'm doing this. You know what paying is. Look, that's that's the sign for cash. Yeah, do you that's, that? Do you remember that? That's mad, that, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> paid and you went in through the bar and you went under the thing and you were in the, the jail and mooched around. Maybe it's been done up since then, I don't know. That's not my experience of it. Okay. My experience is that it's got a very quite posh hotel. All right, okay. And you go in and you're... It's, like, beautiful. And then... <sighs> have I not told you about this? Uh-huh. So you go in and your room is basically like three cells. So you've got the bathroom as one, which is it's really posh. And then your your like lip your bedroom is two. So there's like a little like TV yeah, yeah. bit and sofa, and then there's uh, like wardrobe and then the bed. It is a posh hotel. Now in it as a sort of head nod, apparently it's incredibly haunted as well. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And you your your window is like one of those ones that goes like that and is that big at the end. So it's. And and you open the window because it was quite hot, and then the the wind whistles through because it's so tall as well, so it whistles through. So it does sound creepy at night, but no no nothing going bump in the night. Now in yeah, there and they the have... ghost. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Do you know why we didn't? Right. So because it was a very lovely weekend for us, we'd be down in Cornwall. We're staying in Bodmin. I was like, oh well, we'll treat us to a nice hotel. We'll stay there. So. In it, and rightly so, they acknowledge the history of the building. So they have a little plaque in there talking about a. a a prisoner who was in there and it was this guy who was Italian and he was working on a ship and he had quite profound multiple learning difficulties I'm not quite sure if that's the right terminology and uh, you could from the pitch you could see he was just like not a very well man and basically they were teasing him teasing him teasing him on this ship and then started beating him up and he fought back and he killed a guy and then he got thrown in prison and he didn't really understand what was going on. He didn't speak the language and then he was executed. So we just get into this room. We're like, oh, and reading that. <laughs> and then we're like, oh, that's, that's really shit in it. That's really sad. <laughs> like I wanted to be in a room where like a guy had killed his wife and been yeah, killed yeah, for yeah, it. Yeah. And then later on, I was like, I was like, I had a bath and then I was like in bed with my partner. I was like, how are you feeling, darling? And he's like, just can't stop thinking about that guy and how scared he would have been and how horrible his last moments were and how we're now in like this posh hotel and I was like, yeah, me too. <laughs> and it was like we don't get to have this is quite like, but we don't have sex as much as you want to because there's always people at our fucking houses and because we both work away so it was like oh we're gonna stay in a hotel and so it was like reading that plaque and then being like no no <laughs> just like sleeping on opposite sides of the bed so if you want to have like a sexy weekend away don't go and stay in a ask jail ask for the bestiality suite <laughs> don't don't ask for that one I genuinely if it was on the ship it was like someone who fucked a sheep you'd be like great plough in mate Did you- but when it's something like that when it's like so and it signs off with nowadays he would have 
it basically says he would have been found to have learning difficulties and would have been oh, protected. Oh, fucking hell. Come on. Is that the one person you want to pick for that cell? Well, like, this is it, isn't it? That I think that, like... But you can't go, excuse me, can you have a less sad plaque in the cell, please? I actually don't like hearing about reality. Anyway... What are we talking about? Oh, yeah, so he pretended that he was... No, we were, we're talking about Ethel now in the marriage. Ethel. In 1943, he joins the police reserve, mm. um, which he absolutely buzzes off. He loves the sort of being able to enforce rules. He had a nickname, didn't he? And this is the thing that reminds me of BTK. Do you remember nick- BTK re- was the, the um, dog warden? Yes, yeah, He and people hated him. Yeah, and they called him, isn't it the Himmler of Rillington Place? That was it, yeah. Because yeah. like BTK used to check that the grass was, was a certain he length. He measure the, the grass. Real arsehole. Yeah, and this guy was like that as well, just like absolutely on it with, with every sort of rule like and bylaw was like, mm, you're actually breaking rules, so they hated him. Now, he, at this time, Ethel... It's gone to visit her. They're back together now. Oh, let, let me... I've not even finished his criminal offences. Well, oh, yes! 15th of January, 1923. He was convicted of obtaining money under false pretenses and violent conduct. He got 12 months probation. He committed two further crimes of larceny in 1924 and served consecutive sentences of three and six months. This is... It, we moved to, He's moved to London mm. and he's got quite a nomadic existence at this point. Uh, he moves in with a woman called Maud Claude. Love that name. Love that name. Maud Claude and a young son. Maud she was Claude a sex and a young worker? son. That sounds like something on Britain's Got Talent. Like those, <laughs> like those Greek lads that dance. Are they Greek? Yes. Yeah. Little Stav- 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 Flatley. Yeah. He got a. So what happens with Maud Claude is he gets a cricket bat and he attacks her with it. Right now, he's <sighs> he said he was just testing the bat, which is a terrible what? defense. And he, he's guilty of uh, grievous bodily harm and he gets six months hard labour in prison. Now, then, in 1933, and I think this is my favourite crime, he stole a car from a priest that befriended him. Yeah. And he th- got three months in prison. This is... <laughs> it's such a specific, like, scavenger hunt clue crime <laughs> that, that it, was, it was stolen from a priest. But the, have, have you got the stuff about the post office as well? Because just, he he tampered with the post and he got prison time for that as well. <laughs> but it's so I read something about them. It was like serial killer and post tamperer. And be like, those aren't in the same. Well, I'll things. be honest. Nobody likes a post tamperer. I don't. I don't. You know, postman <gasps> used to nick money out of cards. It's the fucking lowest of the low. That. Yeah, but that's why it's like really heavily penalised as a crime. In Rightly a very so. Sh- I, it's such a weird thing for you. Rightly to so. Draw the line no, I here. think it's fucking nosy and it's sneaky. And I think when people are waiting for stuff in the post, you're making a mockery of, of, of a public, of a system that, that serves a lot of people. I think people also lie about how, uh, about posts going long all the time. I think they're like, oh, the post. I actually think the post is incredibly uh, reliable. It's not bad. But people give themselves masses of leeway. Yeah. I basically only had in three, and bearing in mind in lockdown, we're all buying loads of stuff, in like three years of living back in Wales, I've got one thing go, like go awry. And I get something every single day. I've, I've sent things off and then they've been returned to me because they've not got there. That's happened a couple of times, but that's usually with not the Royal Mail, the other, what, like another, like every or whatever it's called now. Oh my God. They're terrible, don't, aren't they? Yeah, don't get started on that. Um, so, he, however, is reunited with Ethel. Yes. 1933. He's released from prison and he gets back with her. And uh, yeah. she moves to London. And in 1938, they move to the ground floor fa- flat in 10 Rillington Place, Notting Hill. Which, yes. Which, if you see the photographs of 10 Rillington Place, it looks depressing. Mm. It is poverty-stricken. There is yeah. one toilet um, outside for every person that lives within the building. We So they're on the ground floor, and their the flat is over three floors, and... Um, that meant that they had sole access to the garden because also they had a cat and a dog. Um, but there was an outhouse out there which everyone mm-hmm. shared. So above them on the top three floors, there was another two flats. Yeah. Um, it was the end of the row and it was sort of against a factory wall. Rillington Place is now known as, what's the new name of it? It's called Rushton Place. So it does still exist, but it's it's had a rebrand. Very much so. Um, um, also, the, the 
there was an uh, there's an above ground section of the underground that was nearby, and at the time, the sound of the trains was deafening. Yeah, apparently, also, it just sounds a horrible place to live. Yeah, the factory there was dirt, there was smoke every surface, every you couldn't really have the windows open because so much smoke would come inside. It sounds absolutely horrible. I imagine now it's a sort of two point three mil kind of yeah, job. Yeah, absolutely. For one of those. It's not in ill, isn't it? Because they had access to this garden, they did sort of think they were better. They kept themselves to themselves. They didn't really talk to the people. Ethel. Yeah, Ethel and Christy were like, we're, we're the moneyed ones, even though they're all shitting in the same place. Yes. Oh, there was also a washroom, but that was frequently broken, but that was a communal space as well because the washroom comes back again. Yes, it does. Um, so while Ethel was away visiting a family in Sheffield, mm -hmm. he used to use the flat for having sex with other women. Yes. Um, he also had a job at the cinema as a foreman. And uh, as we've said, he joined the War Reserve Police. Mm -hmm. And the reason he was allowed to join that because nobody checked his criminal records. Yeah. And, um, yeah, he, d he did that. He, um... Have I told you my... I've, maybe I've told this when we've done this as a live show, but I think working in a cinema would be, like, one of the dream jobs, and it's something that my fella used to do. He used to work in a cinema. I know you're going to tell me a story, but you've just reminded me. Did I ever tell you about the time that on my birthday I went to the cinema to see the film about The Craze with Tom Hardy? This is what I was doing on Legend. Birthday. Legend, that's it. And I went... And they wouldn't serve me ice cream because it was too cold. What? Yeah. So I went, is this a joke? And they said, no, the ice cream's too cold. We can't serve it yet. And I just went, can you get me the manager? I'm going to another cinema. I just can't cope with this. Then I went to another... Then I went to another cinema and I said, two tickets for, for this. Oh, there's, there's no seats left. And I went, well, there's, there's two chairs there. As he showed me the screen. They're for emergencies. And I said, what kind of emergency are you anticipating? <laughs> well, someone's chair could break. And I went, Does that, has that happened before? And he went, well, you know, might happen today. And I went, can you just sell me the seats? And he went, no, they're for emergencies. And I, I lost the argument because I said, you're a fucking nerd and walked out. <laughs> but how it, it's my birthday. I just want ice cream. Were you wearing a big badge? No! Well, that's why you got <laughs> shitty treatment. If you were in a big badge, you'd have had ice cream bought to your seat. It was too fucking cold. Someone will write in and say, well, actually, I think you'll find the temp... No, they won't. We made it very hard to contact us. Yeah, actually, I think you'll find that due to bacterial temperatures, it can't be served too cold, actually. So... Who is this imaginary person you're having a fight with? It's a nerd. <laughs> that's who it is. You love that word, don't you? Yeah, I love the word nerd. So my fellow was working at a cinema when he was younger yes. and um, it was at the time when Brokeback Mountain I've definitely told you oh. this before <laughs> yeah. Brokeback Mountain was on I might have said this before on the podcast apologies if I have Brokeback Mountain was on and this very old man comes in and says <laughs> there's not it's a small cinema so there's not many sh films showing he says please may I have one ticket to Breakdance Martin <laughs> which <laughs> is obviously they knew what he was Oh. Getting this, so they gave him a ticket for it. Oh, don't. But what was he expecting? And what did he end up seeing? Oh. Do you know what I mean? He's like, break dance, Martin. Sounds like a, a plucky oh. young dance. I used to dance. Oh, and then please. he's watching Heath Ledger filling, Jake chilling. Oh. <laughs> or maybe it's a perfect cover. He's like, I'm going to tell them I think it's break dance, Martin. And then I'm going to have a tug in the back row. <laughs> or, or maybe afterwards he's like, well, if that's break dancing, I'll find some classes near me. <laughs> I've been wasting my time with uh, with swing dancing. I thought that overpromised. <laughs> oh, bless him. Don't know why he sounds like Toby Haydo. <laughs> he was a right like John Christie was like uh, just a knob. So he had all these jobs going on. He was for someone who's very bright. He couldn't really stick at a job, and it was kind of flaky, and would get fired mm -hmm. because he was dishonest well, and a thief. Well, also he's having affairs. He worked at um, Harrow Road, the police station. Mm. And he meets a woman called Gladys Jones, and he starts yeah. having a good, good Welsh name. Mm -hmm. Starts having an affair with her, uh, which lasts until around mid nineteen forty three. Her husband finds out. He comes back from the war. Yeah, and uh, he, he he batters him. He batters him, yeah, yeah, and throws him out because he just moved in, going, "That's oh, fine. He's he's probably going to die in the war." And there's me being like, "There's him being like, I can't see," <laughs> and so he thinks he's going to be fine, and then. I quite like that he gets beaten up. Have I, have I told you that I've started watching Good Night, Sweetheart and I can't stop watching it? Isn't that... Someone explained... Like, when you step back from it, is it George Foray? Because he was going... This is... He was watching it yeah. recently. Brilliant comment. And he was like, this is basically about a man yeah. who's gaslighting two yeah. women in different it's, periods. It's mad. Yeah. Like, 
I'm obsessed with it. I, I, I remember watching it when I was younger and I don't remember much about it. And I just put it on the other day and I'm like, I'm gripped by it because uh, Gary Sparrow, the, the main character, is horrible. He's a liar. He's a cheat. He is manipulative. He's He expects everyone to, to do everything for him. At one point, he fakes his own death. He's horrible. But and he's also meant to be a, a sympathetic f- figure. You're like, yeah, you're meant God, to look at him juggling all this. Yeah, and but I, I'm addicted to it. I can't stop watching really? it. Really? I cannot stop watching it. How many series is it? I think there's about seven, you know. I'm up to three. Seven? I think there's seven, yeah. How can that be longer than the war? Well, let's just see what happens, you know. I can't remember, <laughs> what, I can't remember what happens, but uh, also he's a coward. Oh, my God. Anyway. You would have been handing out those white feathers like no one's business. <laughs> um, so they're living in this flat. They are, they're sort of like high, they, they have quite a, bit, a lot of status in comparison to everyone else, but they are living in an area that, I don't know if this is a problematic word, but was a slum area at yes. the time. Now it's incredibly posh, really. Like, do you know the first time, I've definitely said this, first time I ever went to Notting Hill, I went to meet a, f- in a wild story, I went to meet Richard Branson's sister. It's what happens when you work with people who are in Cambridge Footlights, right? So I went and I got off the tube and I was early and I was like, oh, I'll just go into the Pret and get some food. Who's the first person I saw when I went to Notting Hill Pret? Richard Curtis. No. I went, oh, fuck off and just walked out. Really? Yeah. I was like, no, I don't need this. I mean, great, like, love comic relief and all that, but I was like, just try not to be so on the nose, London. It's, it's not my it's not my bag around there. I, I've been to Notting Hill. I've got, um, I've got a bag with the cat in the hat on it. There's a good little, little like little mad shop. like vintagey like I think it might be crazy very shop. Fucking expensive though, though. Oh uh, uh, yeah, you know, no, not my vibe. Bit bit plastic now, isn't it? Yes, I've told you this, haven't I? So I went to meet in a very weird t- turn of events. Lovely Vanessa Branson, Richard's sister, and uh, she was sort of we were chatting about something. He's the guy that makes the pickle, right? He's the guy who makes the pickle. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And so we're chatting about That's going to be so confusing to some people out there. But it's well, not. She's, she's, she's being facetious. She's being silly. So we're chatting about this project thing, and at the end I'm leaving, she's like, oh, what are you all up to later? And I said, um, oh, well, I'm doing a gig. She said, oh, you're going back to Manchester? I said, no, no, I've got to stay over, because um, I said the trains to Manchester stop at 9 o'clock. And she went, well, that's awful. And I went, yeah, if only someone could do something <laughs> about that. <laughs> and at the time it was owned by Virgin. <laughs> And I was like, oh do, you want to, do you want to give him a bell? Do you want to WhatsApp You've him? You've got a direct line yeah. there. Do you want to, oh, that's awful, isn't it? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. so fucking funny. Um, <gasps> oh, dear. So, he, I don't know if this is where the murders start, you know. I think there might have been some I before. think he's probably done something before and got yeah. away with it. Mm-hmm. Um, because it's a long time to not murder, isn't it? And he kind of come, he comes out the blocks with a very... Uh, it's refined mo yes like oh you, you've got this down very quickly now at the time and obviously there's parallels i think it's interesting that we're doing this now we've done this as a live show before we have but this is the first time we have done this as a podcast in a post roe v wade being overturned Ooh. world there we go because there's a lot of cases here where women were seeking abortions mm-hmm. and he was like i can help you out and he was murdering them yes and sexually assaulting their dead bodies as well so it's horrible and it just shows that that whole thing that people say is when you outlaw abortions you don't stop abortions Mm -hmm. you just stop safe ones exactly and this is a great example of what happens if you aren't allowing people to access that health care so the first murder ruth fewest is she's thought to be the first victim uh, she's only 21. She's only 21. 21 year old Austrian who work in, in a munitions factory. It's thought that she occasionally engaged in sex work to, to make up money because people were fucking poor then, weren't they? Yeah, and also I think that there's probably a surprisingly large amount of people now who are living in fucking shit circumstances who engage in some kind of sex work to get by. Mm. Even if it's that, that guy that they hate that they have sex with, mm. but he'll, he'll go, oh, I'll, I'll buy you shopping or whatever. Like, I, th- I think. It, I I really I resent how when it's talked about with serial killers. Sorry about touching that wire. That will upset Owen. Um, and <laughs> and <laughs> what if I'm tapping out something in Morse code about Owen? Um, <laughs> when I'm talking about sex workers. Anyway, I have done it a couple of times and do apologise as well, Owen. We're making him out to be a right tyrant. Yeah, he's the most sort of like lovely <laughs> passive man ever. He's submissive and big boned. That's what he is. <laughs> it's not. He's a petite thing. Um. So yeah. So. 
Ruth sort of strikes up this kind of friendship, basically. With yes, him. yes, and uh, they he meets her as she's he says the, solicited in a snack bar on Ladbrook Grove, um, which sounds like a, an Arctic Monkeys lyric, doesn't it? <laughs> according to Christie, uh, they met on, on according to Christie, he says on twenty fourth of August, nineteen forty three, he took her to Rillington Place. Ethel was away with the family. She was also I thought had Qatar. This is this weird thing where she was, didn't she get sent to Sheffield to sort her Qatar out? I'm sure it's this thing that's like because this this Qatar thing keeps coming back. Yeah, it's horrible that. Yeah, isn't it? and it's like yeah, I'm sure it's yeah, yeah. It's um so Ethel gets sent away and she's got this. This is where her problems start with. Like, I don't know how you even explain Qatar, but like... It's um, audible. It's like your ears and your... your it's, yeah, it's, like, an, it's an infection, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is a, a persistent infection. It tastes horrible as and well. And it's, you know, it? if you live in, like, squalor, like, you know, like, it, it would have been really dirty where they were living, really unhealthy. I, I, I like suck on my ear, nose and throat, you know, terribly. Yeah. Oh, terribly. Well, I had glue ear as a child, didn't I? I had glue ear as a child. <laughs> I had glue ear as a child. And it's, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's never been. I had grommets. It's never... I, I have earache about three times a month, mate. Have terrible. you checked your hearing? You might have hearing loss. Sorry? Very good. No, I haven't. Honestly, I haven't got hearing loss. I'm totally... I can hear perfectly well. You sadly. don't know, though. I, honestly, I can. It's not... I'm just in pain. Really? Yeah. Is that why you it's behave just, the way you do? Yeah. I'm, I'm off balance. <laughs> no wonder I'm angry. Like, you know... You know when you're, I've got a toothache and you've got no fucking patience for anything. That's how you behave all I'm the like time. I'm like that sheep that your mum. Sheep with a horn pushing into The sheep with a horn pushing into as soon as Someone was, needs to remove that that's horn. That's what I am. I'm like a sheep with a horn embedded in it. Terrible first episode. So many references <laughs> to other things that have happened. <laughs> no, they'll be all right. They'll be fine. So Ethel's away and uh, she's coming back with her brother. Yes. She's up in Sheffield seeing the family. Brings this Ruth over and now... She apparently, his version of events is Ruth comes over, takes off all her clothes and is like, I want to have sex with you <sighs> and I want to elope with you. This is why I don't believe him. Mm. That it just doesn't sound like a thing that a 21-year-old, very sexy woman would be like, I'm just going to rock up, take off all my clothes and be like, please have sex with me Ooh, and then I've elope been, with me. I've been looking for a man with a big forehead and, <laughs> and numerous imaginary illnesses. A throbbing forehead. <laughs> I'd love, well, no. I'd say I love a man that don't talk. I actually hate that. What, men that don't talk? Yeah, I don't trust them. Also, like, you want to have someone you can talk to, right? To a degree. <laughs> to a degree. What would you do if Tim got an illness that meant he lost his voice and couldn't tell you how unwell he was feeling? How would you feel about that? Oh, I'd feel terrible for him, to be honest. I'd, ra I'd rather hear him say he was ill than have him in pain and mute. We nearly saw know? a soft side to you then. You, you did, yeah, I wouldn't like that. That horn pushing into your head nearly yeah. softened. I mean, I'd, I'd put him out of his misery, without a doubt, yeah. Because he can't really tell me. <laughs> What's that? You know. <laughs> <laughs> so they had sex after she walked in, took a bottle of hers. And during sex, he strangled her mm -hmm. and killed her. Ugh. And then he took her leopard print coat, which is how I know she was an absolute legend. Mm -hmm. And he wrapped up the body and then he placed it under the floorboards. Yeah. Very Dennis Nielsen. Very Nielsen. And also, is Muswell Hill? Muswell Hill's North London, isn't it? Uh, I think Hill. Notting Hill's South, West London. West it is, yeah, you're yeah. Right. So he puts her on the floorboards. Now, apparently, he says that he was he was shocked by the bodily fluids. What does that mean? Well, obviously, you're there for a few days. You're dead. There's there's bodily fluids oh, that come out. Yeah, uh, seepage, if you will. And uh, he was like, "Oh, I don't like that." Well, sorry, mate. Yeah, tough tits. I guess don't kill people. Absolutely. So. Ethel and her brother arrive back at the flat pretty much the next day. Yeah. And everything's normal mm -hmm. when they speak to them about it. Like, everything's absolutely fine. Um, and Ethel has just got a part-time job, so she just goes off to do yeah. that. It's like nothing was any different. He was acting exactly the same. Mm -hmm. So while she's out of work, Christy takes Ruth's body and he takes it from the house and he goes and puts it in the wash house. That's a, that communal space. But because the whatever they used in there, the early form of washing machines, those things, right? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> what do you mean? Stiff the, sheets. A mangle? Uh, no, because a mangle's one of them, isn't it? A mangle's one of them. What's this? Do you know what I mean? It's like I've got a big... Uh, the dolly. What? It's a dolly. Is it a dolly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A washing dolly. You... What's that it's mean? It's a stick and it's got things at the side. So I think it's almost like a thing that churns butter. So it's yes, like a stick that yes. goes like that. It, um, let me check. Let me check. You think it's called a dolly? Oh, hold on 
Well, I can tell from how far you're holding your phone away, you need to have your eyes checked. So get your ears done at the same time. Is it a dolly? Show me. Oh, yeah. Nan kid. Nan kid. <laughs> So yes, he goes the whatever it was the, in the wash house. The dolly, the dolly was frequently broken, so people didn't use it as much as they should. Um, so he was like, right, I'm just going to store the body in there. Also, it's cold outside. Oof. He was very into his gardening as well, very proud of his garden. So the fact that he would be digging out there wasn't seen to be unusual because mm-hmm. he was always pissing about in there. So he he digs up the garden. Uh, she's stored in the wash house. He has a brew. And then he would go Don't out at bring night. bring tea into this. And he would go out at night and he would dig a bit more, dig a bit more, until basically he had enough depth to bury her and he buries her with her clothes on. Um, oh, now, oh. this is the bit where she's the one with props at the fence, right? This next one. Yeah. Muriel Edie, who, the name of this, I always say that, you know... Oh, no, no, with, with Ruth. Oh, Ruth. What happens is, is eventually her skull becomes unearthed. I assume it's... Because you have to bury it very deep. I, listen, foxes. I know from foxes, from having chickens that love to die, <laughs> rescue chickens, all they want to do is die, just in case they no one's to get any, Um, that you have to... We basically go to the vet. 50 quid every time we want to have a chicken burnt. Why don't Ma- you rotisserie it? Oh, don't be horrible. <laughs> I'm not going to be like, oh, I'm vegan, except for when an animal dies of natural causes in my own care. Because I refuse to eat my dog because he tastes horrible. Oh, um, oh God, he's got a bladder infection at the moment. And I gave, had to give a bladder sample. I'll show you a picture. It's like oh. a Jaeger bomb. Do you know, I, I know I'm digressing here. I had a bladder infection when I was younger. Uh, and I got it, I think, from... It was the first time I ever went out drinking properly when I was about 15, six, oh. 16. And I drunk Perno. Why? Because I didn't really know anything about booze. And... Uh, I was really, really poorly, and I had a, I had a, a bladder infection, and it it was hand it's hands down the most terrifying thing yeah. that I've ever like I was sh- shivering, yeah, we in blood, yeah, just in so much pain, and it's not blood in we, it's, it's blood, blood, yeah, yeah, it's horrible, it's so frightening, yeah. Well, anyway, he's on medication. Don't worry about that. Why was I talking about this chicken, right? Right, because basically everywhere is like you can't bury it deep enough so a fox won't get it. So there's no way, even if he's going out at night, he's having these bruises, he can't bury this poor woman as deep as it needs to. Yeah, yeah. That's why it has to be like six feet. So her skull becomes uncovered because foxes dig it up. And so he burns it in the rubbish. Oh. It's horrible. Muriel Ede is the second uh, victim that we know of. Uh, he... So he uh, resigns as a uh, special constable after murdering Ruth. No, he gets sacked. Because Does the he? war Says ends he and they don't, they don't know. <gasps> they get sacked because, again, he gets sacked. The war ends and they don't need a police reserve. Oh, okay. Because he Says was basically he like a PCOS. So he was like the dad's army, but for police. And they're like, we don't need you anymore. Well, he goes to work at a radio factory in Acton. And mm-hmm. this is where he meets Muriel Amelia Eady. Now, he told her he could. she had bronchitis. And he says, oh, I can cure that with a special mixture. I hate the word mixture. Really? I don't know. Just It makes me, uh, it makes me think Another of, one? Yeah, I, it just, a mixture. I just don't like the word. Like is dolly mixtures. I don't, I don't like it. Is it because you think of myxomatosis? I think it's because I think of myxomatosis. Yeah, I think that's definitely it. Um, so he um, he says, oh, come to round, come round to my house and I'll, I'll cure this bronchitis of yours. And uh, which really dates this as a chattel blind, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, they <laughs> meet in the canteen, which is quite a nice way to meet someone. I love a canteen. Do you? Oh, what yes. you go to in a canteen? It depends what there is. When I worked at Candles in Manchester, they had a canteen upstairs, and uh, that you know, they had like you know chicken chasseur. That was a popular Hello. thing. Yeah, with chips. Uh, everything with chips. I, I don't know. What would I, I just do you know? I like a nice. You, you know me. I like a baked potato. I was going to say you were going to go baked potato, it. cheese, beans. Anything on a steaming bain marie for you, isn't it? Yummo. <laughs> Yummo. Thank you. Yummo. Yeah. Oh my god. Yummo. <laughs> Absolutely vile. That's made me feel sick. Yummo, mate. Yummo. Now, um, Muriel, like, they got on well, but she was living with her aunt at the time. She had a boyfriend, but she got on well with him. Now, they decided they were going to go out to the pictures together. But this is while, again, he just plans it always when Ethel is away. In fact, he uses the phrase, I planned it all very carefully, which shows premeditation mm-hmm. as well. Um, so, yeah, October 1944, she goes to Sheffield, and he says, I can fix your guitar. Oh, yes. oh, Mr. Darcy. <laughs> <laughs> now, what he'd done is he'd made this mask that would go over um, Muriel's face. And 
he pops the the gas over and it was it was a coal gas it, it was uh it says here so the mixture he made her inhale from a jar with a tube at the top the mixture bleh, was fryer's balsam that was it which was a cure for things yeah. and was a cure for Qatar. Uh, which was uh, and the, uh, which was a pungent solution of benzoin resin in mm-hmm. ethanol. And so that's what you can smell, but actually yes. he's gassing, he's gassing her, her at the same time. So she yeah. passes out and uh, he he rapes her and he strangles her using her stockings. And then he puts the body in the wash house and then in his own time goes... To digs a grave, digs a grave, and buries her. Next to Ruth. Next to Ruth. Now, again, a part of her becomes uncovered because a femur bone comes out of the grave. Which we, which comes around later on. Yes. We, we mentioned this a bit later because on. Because he... When they're doing a search, they see it. Yeah. And they, they don't think anything of it. The police see it, propping up a fence. So he uses this femur bone as like a thing to hold the fence Fuck up in yeah. the gut. It's so brazen, it's unbelievable. It's horrible, isn't it? Well... So, yeah, she ends up in the wash house and then in the grave next to Ruth. So there's so that's two, two so far. Two so far that we know of in the garden. So that's what we're going to go up to for part one. Um, yes. And then we'll do part two, which is where the Evans family come to join the Christie's. And it all goes even more wrong, It gets to be even honest. worse. If possible, it, it gets It does lead worse. to a change in the law, though. Is that a good little spoiler? Like, a, ooh. Ooh, keep coming back. Oh, they'll they'll already, they already look. The people they all have read about it already anyway, haven't they? They just want to hear it again. <laughs> so we'll see you then. 